So I've been talking about contending for revival, and I want to keep on that line, but I want to talk about the heart. You know, it's, it's one thing to pray for revival. It's one thing to uh, be a part of revival. It's one thing to pray and intercede for something. But everything boils down to the heart. So let me give you a few verses real quick. Let me begin with, and you don't have to turn there unless you would like, but I'm going to go through several verses. So if you're going to turn with me, you're going to be um, quick fingers. Psalms 24 Verses 4 and 5 says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the, from the God of his salvation. Now, first off, over the last several, well, really years, every so often I, I, I will be in prayer or studying, and it's like that verse comes to mind. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands refers to actions. Hands are actions, and the heart is the intentions. You know, somebody can have the right actions, but if their intentions are wrong, it does not matter, right? Like when a child comes to you, if, if a child comes to you and says, oh, you are so pretty, you know, when your child tells you that, there's a moment that just, oh. but then there's another moment that hits you. What do you want? <laughs> right? See, when, when we go before the Lord and our intentions are wrong, our heart is wrong, then it nullifies everything else. When we're dealing with people, if our intentions or our motives are to control or manipulate or to get what we want, our intentions, our heart is completely wrong no matter how good the actions are. It's the heart. This is what made David so special. He was a man after God's own heart, not after God's own actions. Pure actions come from pure hearts, right? If you get your heart lined up, your actions will follow through. I was talking to someone the other day, and I've made this statement several times. I'm not the best with words, right? Sometimes I express words differently than my heart expresses thoughts. You do it too, so don't even look at me like that. Sometimes we say things in a different manner than what we mean them. Our heart is right in what we mean, but our mouth gets all twisted up and, and words come out a little bit wrong, and people misunderstand what we're saying, especially when you're preaching. It's worse up here because, one, you, you're, you're under the, the uh, focus of, of that message, so your, your thought pattern is limited to a, a very small uh, um, realm in that, in that definition. But, two, the enemy is working on you people when I'm preaching. Right? Satan seeks to distort what you hear. Right? That's why... You have to be so careful what you say because somebody's going to take it wrong. Because the enemy's at work. But if you know the person, then you know their heart. That's why I think it's so much easier to hear prophecy from someone that you have relationship with because when you have relationship with them, you understand their heart. Their heart is for your betterment. Their heart is for your advancement. So if it's a word of correction, guess what? That means that they're doing that to see you grow and advance. If you don't know them, you think they're just being mean. And they may be. <laughs> so it's the heart. It boils down to there. So I want to give you three points of revival that I feel in this hour, especially when it comes to our prayer. The, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that right now I, I, I feel that we are in a Nehemiah season, that we are rebuilding the wall of intercession, rebuilding the wall in front of our house. That means that, that you are focused or are, are commissioned with being an intercessor, and, and as we all are. Let me, let me make one clear point. The term intercessor is not an office. <laughs> Apostle is an office. A prophet is an office. A pastor is an office. A teacher and evangelist are offices. An intercessor is not an office. The church really messed up when they began to call intercessors into an office. 
They begin to take authority where it was not theirs. It was illegitimate authority. But it is a very powerful place, and we are all called to be intercessors to a degree. Granted, there are some more gifted in that way, but we are all called to be intercessors. So in this season, we are to be building the wall in front of our house. That means that we each have a responsibility to be praying and interceding and seeking revival for our family, for this church, for this city, for this nation. But it takes a people with the right heart because the more moment your heart gets messed up, the moment your heart gets skewed just a little bit, then your prayers are completely off target. If you and I stand back here and we're shooting down a range and I'm dead on target and you're dead on target and then a little breeze blows and just moves it just a little bit, guess what? It's going to miss the entire target when it gets down the range. All it takes is a, Satan doesn't just come in with a blatant lie. He comes in to pervert just a little bit the truth. Because a little perversion is a lot of perversion. The whole yin and yang, a little evil and all good, and a little good and all evil, it's not true. There is good, which is God, and there is evil. And if Satan can ever put a little drop of evil in good, then it perverts the whole thing. So when it comes to intercession, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to seeking for revival, the moment that our heart is, is off just a little bit, then Satan begins to cheer. Yes, they're going to miss the target. Now I can give them a counterfeit. I can give them hype instead of glory. I can give them loud instead of sincere. I can get loud. <laughs> you can tell. But I can be sincere. My loud is sincere. When I get loud, it's because I'm excited. I tried to scream at the graduation the other night. We in public. <laughs> right? Everybody's got an air horn. Somebody had an air horn right behind my head. <laughs> Every now and then, you know, you'd think I was having a seizure. They'd blow it, and me and Shauna both. <laughs> But then Savannah hits me and says, when they call Zach's name, let's, let's scream with me, Daddy, and scream with me. I, say, I said, okay. <laughs> you know, that, that's that moment, you know, you both go and then you hold back. Yeah. So I'm clapping. Shauna's clapping. Savannah is screaming. And I was like, she actually did it. <laughs> she gets that from her mama. <laughs> no, we... Satan seeks to replace religion with relationship. An authentic experience in the presence of God with flesh. You know, if the right person comes in, I'm not the right person, I can tell you that. But if the right one comes in, they can get you hyped up about anything. They can get you standing and clapping and shouting. And everybody will walk out and say, oh, that was anointed. No, it wasn't. Just because somebody can get you hyped up. I've been to those meetings. I went to a, 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 a real estate investment meeting. That guy had me so excited, I was about to cheer him down. And, and then he got to how much you need to invest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he broke that nursing <laughs> right there. So there's a difference in between flesh and the presence of God. There's a difference in between uh, uh, a religion or, or talent and skill. We have magi mu musicians, <laughs> musicians that are talented, but there's a difference in between the anointing and talent. The talent don't make you cry when you begin to sing, right? It's the presence of God. It comes down to the heart. So three points of revival that I believe we have to have, particularly in our prayers, or humility, brokenness, and obedience. That's hard, amen? Okay, y'all not being honest. I'll be honest for you. That's hard. Let me give you a few verses. I'm going to just read these straight through. First off, Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. 
James 4, 6, and 7. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Psalms 75, 6, and 7. I hope I haven't gone too fast for those of you taking notes. Uh, for not from the east or the west... And not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but God who executes judgment, putting one down and lifting up another. That's 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6. James 4, verses 6, 7, and 10. Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. Now, this is something that the Lord has ministered to me so many times. Have you ever noticed that, that, that God has a funny way of helping you out? <laughs> Scripture says, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. See, God doesn't want to humble you. He wants you to be humble, but he doesn't want to be the one to humble you. He tells you, humble yourself. Why? Because humility is painful. It's not comfortable. See, we begin to step out, and God begins to bless us, and he's carrying us because he is strong, and he is mighty, and he allows us to operate with his power and his authority. But the moment we forget it's his, the moment we think we got it, then he pulls back. When we don't humble ourselves, he allows us to be humbled. Humble is the root word for, for humiliation. <laughs> Right? The moment you think as a preacher that you the one that God sit, then God leaves off his... It, I don't care how good the message is. I don't care how deep the message is. I don't care, care how well thought out, how well planned, how well devised. Without the anointing of God, it's nothing. Because it has no power without the power of God. It's not by our power, it's not by our might, but it's by his spirit. Without his spirit on it, it's nothing. Smith Wigglesworth was practically blind at the end of his life, and he would get down to read just like this. His face would be so close to the pages that he could not see anything else, and the entire congregation would be out slain, and he would have no idea because the glory of God was so powerful, it did not take somebody just laying hands on All it took was reading the Word of God, but the power of God was so strong in that place. See, it's the presence, it's the glory, it's the power of God, not the ability of man. That's why God's not worried about your abilities. Praise God. <laughs> he doesn't care how smart you are, how good of a speaker you are. He doesn't care because he don't need your talent. He gave you your talent. He can equip you when the moment's right. My first speech class... <laughs> oh, it was awful. I was in speech class at ULM, and it was going to be a five-minute speech. And I, 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 I called Daddy. <laughs> I said, Daddy, they're going to make me talk for five minutes in front of 12 people, Daddy. <laughs> this one guy speaks seven languages. He, he did. He, he, got a, he spoke fluent Japanese Chinese, uh, uh, Spanish, and uh, French, and something else, and something. I, I was just, and that was his speech, was going through the different languages. Well, that was easy. Nobody knows what you're saying. <laughs> Cheater. So, Daddy said, just find something you're comfortable with. I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, just relax. So, I get up there. I did a demonstration on, on cleaning a gun because that was the only thing I felt that I could. <laughs> If nothing else, I could scare them enough that they'd give me a break. <laughs> I passed out pictures because we weren't allowed to actually have a gun at the school, you know. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and, I, and I'm, I'm reading through my thing. It's supposed to be five minutes, and I'm just reading through it, and I'm passing out pictures, and this, this one guy raises his hand for a question. I'm like, no, I wasn't planning on that. How do I handle that? <laughs> what kind of gun is that? <laughs> the kind that shoots. What do you think? <laughs> Now, what was God thinking to put me as a preacher? Don't, didn't God know I can't speak in front of people? Right? Didn't God know that Moses 
couldn't speak in front of people. He said, God, I have, a, I have a stutter. How can I speak in front of people? And he said, I didn't ask you uh, your excuse. I said, go. You know, God doesn't care about our inabilities. In 2 in, in Second Corinthians, uh, I believe it's chapter 12, I believe. I'll have to give you the address in a, in a moment. But Jesus told Paul, he said, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. See, it's when we are weak and broken and humble that God says, I can use you. The moment we begin to get strong in our own ability, God says, ah, oh, I can't use that. That's the difference between Saul and David. Saul thought that he had it figured out. Saul was a man head and shoulders above the rest. Saul was a man that looked like a king, acted like a king, smelled like a king, walked like a king. David was a shepherd boy. You know what a shepherd boy smells like? Not like a king. <laughs> Revelation. You know what he looks like? He's not clean because he's been tending the sheep. He probably a little bloody after them lions and bears, but his heart was right. We have to get the right heart. I'm not saying you have to be dirty. <laughs> I would prefer you bathe before coming to church. That's just my preference, but I'm not sitting by you, so it really don't matter. I'm up here. <laughs> the two worst things that we can experience in life Great success and great failure. It's the, it's the worst things. Great failure brings depression, oppression, discouragement, giving up. That's that moment that grow not weary and well-doing for in due season you will reap if you faint not. Great failure causes you to want to faint. Great failure says, I can't do this anymore. I am broken. I am messed up. I can't succeed. It's over. Every time in the, with the children of Israel, every time something happened, they come out of Egypt, and then all of a sudden they look around. They're all excited. They're cheering. They're, they're, they're praising the Lord, and they come to a Red Sea, and then they give up right there because they consider that to be failure. You're all oh, just let the Egyptians take us. And then the, the God parts the Red Sea. They come across that and they're singing praises. The horse and a rider fell into the sea. They are having a charismatic revival coming all the way out until lunchtime. When lunchtime comes and they get hungry, oh, God abandoned us. That's human nature. You know I'm right. See, great failure is one of the worst things that we can have because we give up. Great success is one of the worst things that we can have because we think we got it. I had someone tell me, ask them, ask me to bring them to the church because they would bring revival. But they assured me that they would give me the credit for the revival that they would bring. That's what I said. <laughs> okay. Really? <laughs> there was a moment there that I was fixing to offer something. Can I buy you for what you're worth <laughs> and sell you for what you think you're worth? <laughs> See, that's one man's heart. We're not meant to carry glory. My mother was... Uh, Friday night, and, and she, she talked about some of this this morning, about how Lucifer would, would bring in God's glory, right, with the worship, and then he would release God's glory. We're not meant to carry. The, the glory is not meant for us. The moment that we begin to think the glory is meant for us, then we fall to the same trap that Lucifer did. The same thing. It's the pride. It's the self-worship. It's the self-glorification. You know what happens when you pat somebody on the, on the back? It, there's a pump back here, and every time you pat, it just pumps up their head. Remember the old Reebok pumps? It's like that. There's no glory to God in that. It's a fight to stay humble because when you begin to see success, then you begin to see God move, and you're like, wow, this is awesome. But then you begin to think, I'm awesome. <laughs> right? You, you know who's immune to that? 
No, you don't. <laughs> Not a one of us immune to it. Men may be worse than women. I'll just be honest with you, because there is a level of, of this male bravado that we carry. So, so they're, they're, you know, I think men may be a little more susceptible, but, but that, don't, that is no need for you to say, hey, man, you ladies, that was rude. <laughs> that was very rude. I'm glad my wife is in the back this morning. <laughs> Watch Revival. A few weeks ago, I did a teaching on some of the previous revivals, and you can see when man began to take control, revival began to die. Man began to take control because man began to have pride and arrogance because man did not stay humble. When Azusa Street revival began, William Seymour would put a bag over his head so that no one could see his face. Uh, within a few years, that bag was removed, and now you had a semi-throne that was placed right? That's a big change. When revival begins and it happens in a particular denomination, you know what happens? The denomination comes together and begins to legislate that revival. You can't legislate a move of God. I was reading a, uh, a book or listening to a sermon by Jim Cimbala, and he said that he went to visit a church, and, and he was supposed to speak on revival. And when he got there, they told him that he had 29, and, uh, 29 minutes and 30 seconds to preach. He said, 30 seconds? <laughs> they said, yes, the worship will last approximately, uh, exactly this long down to the second, and then we will have an offering, and then we will have a special singer, and then we will have this, and, then, uh, and, and the service cannot last any more than 60 minutes. So you will have exactly 29 minutes and 30 seconds. Tell me I got 29 minutes and 30 seconds. I might as well just close. I'm going to give up. I'm going to tell you all I'm going to do is confuse you in 29 minutes and 30 seconds. Go to a ball game. How long does a ball game last? JL's ball games last an hour and a half, and that's for the Dixie League. Do you know how many times I sit there and watch my, my, my watch? Oh, I wish they'd just call the game. It's been 15 minutes. Would they ever just quit playing? No, we enjoy that. Come to church. Oh, it's been 10 minutes. Will he ever shut up? <laughs> Was that guilt? Is that, is, is that what I heard? <laughs> I love picking on Zach. He's my buddy. See what happens is man begins to try to control. See, there's a move of God. There is a wave of revival about to hit this nation, and there will be no denomination. There will be no superstar preacher. There will be no, no group of people. There will be no geographic location that will be able to lay claim to that revival. It won't be a revival uh, 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 of such and such place. It won't be the revival of Bastrop, Louisiana. Bastrop, Louisiana will be a part of a revival that covers the nation. It will not be a revival of the Assembly of God or of the Baptist or of the, the, the United Pentecost. It will be a revival of the church of God, not the denomination. <laughs> the ecclesia, the assembling together of God's people. See, the first thing y'all thought when I said church of God was, is that the one from Cleveland? I feel that there is a great revival, a wave of revival that is about to hit I think that in many ways, God's allowed the condition of America to get like it is, to bring desperation to his church so that we will pray. When our government legislates things, guess what? That curse comes upon the nation. In your house, when you stand as the, as the gatekeeper of your house and you allow perversion into your house, guess what? You've allowed that there. When you allow drug addiction, You've allowed it. If you have a child that you know is on drugs and you allow them to bring the drugs in your home, guess what? You're responsible. Right? Now, I'm not saying things can't be snuck by you. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that when you allow something openly, when you legislate it, you bring the curse. 
When our nation does that, I think God is allowing the church to look and say, our government's not going to save us. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they're both the same anyway. Right? People will fight on whether they're Republican or Democrat, or whether you are a supporter of Hillary Clinton or, or, or Donald Trump. I don't care who you support at this point. Right now, we better support Jesus Christ. We better look at revival and pray to God that he calls the people upon this nation to rise up. In that, let me give a disclaimer. It's a liberal agenda that has been pushed for all these years continues the way that it is going then politically economically and spiritually it will be the remnant church in America that survives because the nation will be done for if they continue like this they are intentionally strategically trying to destroy this nation and if that offends your political uh, uh, preferences look at that it's there so there's a great move of God coming. And then God's looking and he's allowing people to get desperate. Do you know you won't make a change when you're comfortable? Right? If something's bothering you but it's not bothering you bad, you're not going to make a change. If you don't feel good but you don't feel bad enough to go to the doctor, you're just going to continue not to feel good. Right? When you feel bad enough that you say, I don't want to keep on going like this, then you say, I got to make a change. When, you, when your health begins to bother you, you begin to make the changes. I, I have, since pastoring, something has happened to me. <laughs> I was fine before I took this position, and I started feeling bad. Continually. So I finally started feeling bad enough that I told Sean, I got to do something. I began to eat healthy. I haven't drank Cokes in like two months, except for when they messed up my order at one place. That's good. I mean, I used to think that water was of the devil, and God bless Coke. The promised land was flowing with Coke and honey. It was, I've been trying to find it in scripture for years. And then Sean, I had to go start working for a dentist and he had to give me revelation that I didn't want to receive. And then he would tell me if this, you know, this is what Coke does to your teeth. Can you imagine what it's doing to your bone? Did you know that, you know, I was talk, even talking to Mike about this the other day. He said, I don't know that I want to put something in my mouth that they use to clean corrosion off of batteries. <laughs> <laughs> my mother said that sure is good though <laughs> it is but then you begin to make a change and then you say I don't want to continue on that pattern you begin to make a change and then you begin to feel better and then you go to the end zone and find out that they have cheesecake and then you realize something the devil's around every corner <laughs> I'm going to move on. I will tell you this. If you go to end zone, try their cheesecake drizzle with caramel. Oh. I wasn't going to get that. The kids got it. Savannah got cheesecake. And, and then she said, Daddy, you've got to try this. And I was like, babe, I'm fine. And then I took a bite and I was like, I had a relapse. <laughs> I repent. I had a relapse. <coughs> almost had a relapse at 2 o'clock this morning, too. Let me move on. I'm going to get to confessing. Cheesecake was gone, so I couldn't get it. Anyway, God's allowing the nation or the church to become desperate in those moments. But look at this. Satan always has a counterfeit. He always has an agenda that he's working. Why do you see the theologies within the popular church, the pop culture church today, scream out no repentance? Because God's revival is going to begin with repentance. Why, why does the, the pop culture give nothing but self-help? Because God's revival is going to, going to be with a people who are kingdom-minded, who are focused on the kingdom of God, the presence of 
of God, not on me. It is, see, all that boils down to worship of self. It is, oh, let me see how good I can be. Let me see how, how I can use the principles here to make me better. Now, of course, God wants us to use his principles. Of course, he wants to bless us. Of course, he wants to grow us, mature us, and make us better. But it's not about us. When we make it about us, we miss it. The pop culture church in America today is making it all about us. Give me $59.95 and I will give you a prophetic word that's going to tell you how good you are. Right? We just had one arrested the other day uh, because he was raising the dead for, for uh, I think it was 1100 It was a prophetic word for 50 healing for 250 I think. I think deliverance was a little bit more expensive. He uh, raising from the dead was eleven eleven twenty five I think one thousand one hundred twenty five dollars FBI got him. If I said his name, you'd probably know who he was. That's sad. See, that's pop culture church. It's all about you. It's th- this book is not all about you. It's all about him. We reap the benefit, but it's about him. The remnant church that's crying out for revival will be desperate. They will be crying in repentance. They will be crying in brokenness. Let me give you a couple things. I'm going I'm to hurry up. I didn't mean to get on the end zone cheesecake. That was just not godly, I don't think. So the first thing is humility. We must humble ourselves. Amen. Next is brokenness. This is what made Hannah so, her, her prayer so powerful. She was completely broken and abandoned to herself. You can read the story in 1 Samuel 1. She was completely broken and abandoned to, to her own ability. She came to the temple and, and, and Eli said, why are you drunk? She said, I'm not drunk. I am a broken woman in deep grief. See, that's where intercession, if you really want to be good at intercession, if you really want to see things happen in intercession, then you've got to allow yourself to be broken by what breaks God. When you look at the great revivals, Evan Roberts that that led the Welch revival that saw literally over 100,000 people saved in the matter of uh, of less than two years, it began when he was at a prayer meeting and he began to cry out, Lord, break me, break me. Jesus said, I don't do anything lest I see the Father do it first. He would see God working, and he would be moved with with compassion, with brokenness for what broke God's heart. And then he would enter into what God was already doing. If each of us did that, if each of us said, God, break me with what breaks you, break my heart with what breaks your heart, how much would that change? What we, we would get mad at each other a whole lot less. That was quiet. <laughs> I'll amen that one for you. If, if our hearts were broken by what breaks God's, then we would look, we wouldn't be fighting over Republican and Democrat. We would be trying to build a, a, a new party, the Christ-like party, which would not belong in politics. <laughs> that would be an oxymoron. Right now we just have morons. <laughs> that was ugly. Um, Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not having a politically happy day. I do believe that God can use people in office, and I pray that he does. And I think that some of them have some really good ideas. But I am just really, I guess I, I was, I've been looking for David for all these years. And David was not President Obama, and he wasn't President Bush, and he wasn't President Clinton. Pretty close on Reagan. Anyway. We have humility and we have brokenness. When we get to the brokenness and we allow God to break us. So many revivals started right there in that brokenness. Matter of fact, John Kilpatrick, right before the Brownsville 
revival broke out. One week before, he was sitting on his back porch on a swing, and he was just having, having a time of prayer, drinking his coffee, and he started crying. And he said, God, I'm so tired of going into that church and preaching about your healing and your deliverance and all about your power and not seeing anything happen. And he began to cry. He said, God, I would be better off pumping gas somewhere than going back into that place and preaching about something else that's not going to happen. Lord, I don't know what to do. God, I, am, I, I don't want to even look at that pulpit again. He was broken in the office of pastor. He was broken as a minister. And he said, there's nothing I can do to bring your miracles. There's nothing I can do to bring your glory. There's nothing I can do to see anything change except for read these messages. And God, I, don't, I would do better pumping somebody's gas. The next week, revival broke out. Millions of people have been impacted by what happened in Brownsville. Revival begins with repentance, with brokenness, with humility, and with obedience. Last one is obedience. Luke twenty two forty two 42 says, this is Jesus crying out to God. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. I was praying at one point several months ago, and I felt the Lord speak that verse to me, not my will, but yours. Do you know how hard that is? When you're praying for something, and you have to stop and say, God. It's kind of like Moses. You get that stutter real quick. <laughs> not my will, but yours. There are things that we know exactly what God's will are, but there are decisions and there are timings and all of these things that we don't know. And in those moments, we have to submit to God's will. We have to stop and say, Lord, I really, I, I, God, I, I would really love to take this step, but not my will, yours. That's, that's a heartbreaking prayer within and of itself. Because true obedience comes from true submission. True submission, you really don't know how submitted you are until God tells you no. When God tells you no and you listen, that's, that's, that's real submission. He's looking for obedience. Because obedience that will obey the no will also obey the yes. When Jesus said, not my will, that word will is determination. It is choice. It is purpose. It is inclination. It is desire. It is pleasure. It is will. This is something that got so off in the, in the charismatic movement was when people began to uh, seek what they wanted versus what God wanted. This is when people began to, this is where Jezebel was really uh, uh, revived at, was in this motive of people beginning to experience success in prayer. And then they began to say, well, I want this. And then they began to stop saying, thy will be done. They stopped saying, Lord, show me your will. Show my heart what your will is. And they began to enforce their will. That is when we get off of the target just a little bit, and then we, we miss it all together. We open the door for the enemy to come in. We begin to focus on ourselves, our own desires. Let me give you one last thing. Look at Joshua with me. You can look at Joshua 1. Let me put these together in, in, in these guys, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was an understudy to Moses. He was Moses' right hand. He stayed. He was his shadow. As my dad would say about me, he was in his pocket all the time. And Joshua and Caleb were one of the 12, or two of the 12 spies that went out to spy the land in Numbers 13. They sent a spy from every tribe. They sent them out to the promised land and, and to survey what would happen. And the 12 uh, spies came back. Ten of the spies said, oh, there's these giants in the land and we are grasshoppers in their sight. Well, Joshua and Caleb, I'm sure they saw the, the giants, but what they really saw was, was um, uh, coke and honey and, and big grapes. So... Y'all didn't even catch that. Thank you. 
They came back and they said, Moses, we've seen the land and it is good and it is ready for God to, to, to allow us to take it. It is ripe for the taking. We are ready. And the other ten said, oh, there's these big people over there. Now, Joshua and Caleb could have got all cocky and arrogant right here. And they could have got together and said, you know what? If the other ten don't want to take it, it's not our strength anyway. It's God's strength. Come on. Let, let, let's just, let's go show them what God can do. Have you ever had that moment? <laughs> We've all kind of had that moment. <laughs> we'll show them what God can do. Well, what we really mean is, we're going to show them what we can do. <laughs> they didn't. They were not allowed to. The timing was not there. Why? It wasn't because the land wasn't ready. It's because God wasn't ready. It's because God's people were not ready. He said, I have a plan and a purpose. I have a way of doing this, and this is not fitting the way that I want to do this. So the two of you better just uh, uh, sit back and learn. Sit back here. You sit under Moses. When the time's right, we'll, we'll get there. The disobedience of the ten cost them from going into the promised land. The obedience of the two allowed them to remain. The only two that remained from, from all that old tribe were Joshua and Caleb. And then when they come in, in Joshua chapter 1, God begins to remind Joshua, be strong and be courageous, for I have been with Moses and I will be with you. I will speak to you. Be strong and be courageous. Be very strong and very courageous. Man, that is so encouraging. But when God tells you to be strong and be courageous, what he's really telling you is, you're about to go through something that you are not big enough to handle and you better know that I'm with you so then he says consecrate the people repentance 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 something our church in America keeps on running away from is the very thing that brings us closer to God and it says God I'm a broken man Lord heal me Lord I'm sorry one of the scariest feelings when you're praying is when you, when you feel the, the, the anointing quenched. There was one time I was praying, and, 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 and I, I said something completely off. I don't even know what. It wasn't anything bad, but it was not what the Lord was speaking, and I felt the anointing. It grieved. I'm not talking about the anointing lift. I'm talking about grieved. It grieved the Holy Spirit, and I stopped. Scared me. Because if I make one of you mad, you'll forgive me. I probably done made three of you mad this morning. That's because I'm not finished. The other ten of you, I'm working on you. I will offend myself if I come back tonight. Come on, really? If, if I don't come back. Yeah, mama preaching tonight then. When I felt the grief hit the Holy Spirit, I stopped and I was like, I began to repent immediately. That's a scary feeling. So he said, consecrate the people, cleanse the people. And then in chapter 3, Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out for Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, and all the people of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. And the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it of about 2,000 cubits in length. See, all this was going through, through the, the, the instructions. God gave them the strategy. Guess what? When you think you're going to do something, even if God's given you the release, you better know that he's given you the strategy. Amen? Amen. And then when they, they set out to the flood of Jordan, it's flooded, and, and then the priests step out, the water parts, they cross over on dry land. Now up to this point, God had told the people that uh, Joshua was going to be their leader. Moses had told the people that Joshua was going to be their leader. Joshua had told the people he was going to be their leader. But there was, no, there was still that insecurity. Are we really going to follow you or not? And when the waters parted and they crossed over, they began to come over the water and said, Joshua, today the Lord Lord has shown you his favor upon you. We will follow you as we did Moses. Guess what? People will not follow you just because you said God sent you. It will be the proof of God's hand on your life. So when Joshua came, you know what happened to Joshua? This is my opinion. I think that was a part of Joshua. I said, yeah. <laughs> I've been nominated by the Lord to be your leader. 
we're going to cross another flood of Jordan. <laughs> there had to be a level of him that was encouraged. <laughs> Because after this, they're headed to Jericho, and in chapter 5, they come across, and it says in 13, 513, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries. I can relate with this personally because I'm just thinking if I just saw the flood of Jordan parted and God told us to go defeat uh, uh, Jericho and we're marching through, I would. he was looking down and said, then he looked up, man, I'd be flipping through my phone. Facebook, flood of Jordan parted. Hashtag God is good. Hashtag revival at the upper room. Hashtag, don't stand in our way. Hashtag, ain't no giant big enough. And there's some guy standing in the way. Hey, boy, are you with us or against us? And then all of a sudden, this angel stands up and says, no. When you ask somebody a this or that question and they answer no, guess what? They didn't get the answer wrong. You got the question wrong. He said, are you with us or against us? And the angel said, no. Who are you with? I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Can we say humility? All of a sudden, Joshua went from to, he bowed his face and he said, forgive me. What would the Lord have me do? See, we all are going to get cocky and arrogant at times, but we better be sensitive to the Lord when we say, God, what are we going to do today? And he says, no. y'all haven't felt that then take my word for it and then the angel verse 14 and he said no but I am the commander of the Lord's army now I have come and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him and said what does my Lord say to his servant and the angel says take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy and Joshua did it that's good stuff right there in Hebrews 11, it says that these things were given to us, referring to the people that have gone on before us, the, uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and so forth. They, their lives were given to us as, as uh, uh, examples of the things that we should do and the things that we should not do. We can learn from other people's mistakes. Amen? I'm hurrying up. I'm about, I'm about to close. No applause I needed there. So, he was humbled in that moment. They go to Jericho. The walls fall from Jericho. You know who knocked the walls down? <laughs> it wasn't Joshua. <laughs> it wasn't because they blew the shofar so loud that it literally just vibrated the walls down. No, that, the commander of the Lord's army had already met with him and, and let him know that they were going to knock down the walls. And uh, they were just wanting to know if Joshua and them were coming or not. <laughs> It's God's strength. So they come out of Jericho, and they, they, they have this moment of, of just uh, uh, excitement and zeal. When God does something, it's exciting. And they come out, and in chapter 7, they come to a place called Ai. And they send out spies to Ai, and they come back, and they said, uh, uh, Joshua, it's not even big enough to send the, all the people to. Just send a, 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 a small fraction of us. After what happened in Jericho, see, that was a mistake right there. They thought they did Jericho. After what happened in Jericho, Ai will be nothing. And so he sent 3,000 men, and the ones that survived came back with their tails tucked between their legs because they did not ask God. They went to battle of their own will, of their own ideas, using their own strategies, and they were defeated because they did not start where they started before. So then Joshua runs back to the presence of God. Chapter 7. Verse 6 says, Then Joshua tore his clothes. He fell to the earth on his face before the ark of God until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads, which is mourning. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan? And the Lord 
And, O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off your name from the earth. What will we do for your great name? Let me tell you how I interpret this. You can interpret it uh, uh, differently, but this is what I'm seeing in this. Because Joshua was so built up after coming across the Jordan and after Jericho, he cries all day and then he says, Oh, Lord, why have you brought us out here to destroy us? We we would have been fine just crossing the Jordan. What are we going to tell the people when, when we have had to turn our backs on? The, in other words, God, you said I was the leader and now I failed. What are they going to do now? They going to vote me out. <laughs> y'all didn't laugh at that because y'all aren't pastors. <laughs> Lord, I knew you called me to bring revival, but nobody showed up to church but me. I haven't done that well yet. Lord, I just know your glory was going to come, but when we were praying today, everybody fell asleep. Jim Cimbala, the pastor of, of, of Brooklyn Tabernacle, their small church, I think they have like, what, 15,000, 20,000 members, something like that. They started out with 25 until Brother Cimbala was put in as pastor. And then they dropped down to 18 in the first month. One lady came to him and said, Brother Cimbala, I love you to death, but if you don't stop preaching, I cannot continue to come to this church. I cannot stand your preaching. Now you talk about a pat on the back. See, God knows how to keep you humble. The church was in such a bad shape, he got physically ill. Went away for a vacation, and the Lord spoke to him on vacation, said, if you'll lead people to my presence, the only problem you'll ever have is housing the people. Now, to this day, that's, that's been some 30 years ago. To this day, when you listen to Jim Cimbala speak, when you listen to him preach, or when you listen to interviews, I am so moved by this man because what I hear is humility. When I listen to him, even the sound of his voice, he's so humble. He's still so broken. His focus has never been on building a big church. It's been just on being with God. That was his heart, was to be in God's presence. It wasn't about people. That means that he don't mind offending people. He had a young couple that was living together come to him, and, and they were coming in the church, and they wanted to be prayed for. So he goes to pray for them, and they said, we want to be blessed. And he said, how can I bless you? You're living in sin. He said, if you want me to bless you, either break up or go get married. Stop fornicating and I can bless you. See, he wasn't worried about hurting people's feelings. He was worried about hurting God's. When we stop worrying about man and we start worrying about God, something's going to change. If you're not offended when you read the word of God, then you're not reading the right translation. All I can tell you, because God convicts me when I read his word, I start reading and go, oh, that's me. God, why'd you lead me to that verse? Give me the verse about blessing, enlarging my territory, expansion. Humble yourself. So they get defeated at Ai. I love God's response to Joshua. I'm, I really am fixing to close. God's response to Joshua is in verse 10. Then he said to Joshua, get up. <laughs> Why have you fallen on your face? See, God has such a part that is so compassionate and caring. And then he has another part that's like a daddy. He says, boy, get up. Why are you coming to me crying because you're embarrassed, because you were defeated? When did you ask me to go to that battle? When did you ask me if you had victory? Get up. Listen to what I told you the first time. It wasn't that God didn't care. He was teaching a lesson, right? He said, get up. He had already told him. And then he gave him what was wrong. Then he exposed what was wrong. And he said, now what are you going to do? See, when we go through, through good success that brings failure or failure itself, we come to God and then God gives us the instructions. And now we have a pivotal moment. What are you going to do with your failure? What are you going to do with your success? What are you going to do with it? He said, you disobeyed my commands. Achan took some gold from Jericho, which they were commanded not to do. So then Joshua was faced with his first really, 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 really difficult leadership position, uh, decision. Now he's got to figure out, well, am I going to slap Achan on the wrist or, or am I going to bury him? 
This is Old Testament. I'm not giving New Testament rules to this. <laughs> I'm not saying that we should, you know, find the one bringing sin in the church and kill them. But that's what they did. <laughs> that's a hard decision. So Joshua brings Achan out. Now remember, he was with Moses when Korah stood up against Moses and God swallowed him up in the earth. So he already knew what had to be done. He brings Achan out. He, he, he kills Achan. They have him executed for, the, for bringing this judgment on the nation or on the, on the people. And then he says, he goes back to God's presence. Now Joshua's got this thing figured out. I better go ask God before I do anything. This is what made David so unique. Before he went into battle, David would go, God, do I have the victory? And then when God said yes, then he would say, what do we do to have the victory? There were times when God said, hit them head on. There were times that God said, go around to the rear and wait till you hear the sound of the angels over your head. Right here, he told Joshua, he gave him the strategy. They go back to Ai and they destroy Ai. They go to the next city and destroy them. They go to the next city and destroy them. They go to the next city and destroy them. They begin to, to inhabit the promised land through obedience, through humility, and through brokenness. There is a promised land of revival for the church in America and for this church, but it will not be inhabited by people that are proud, disobedient, Right? And unbroken. When we pray, you can stand with me this morning. When we pray, we should pray from a place of humility, obedience, and brokenness. When you begin to fight for something, Begin to ask God, Lord, show me your will. I was praying about something the other night. And I said, God, please show me where I'm wrong. I said, God, please, if, if, I'm, if I am off even the slightest on this, God, please show me. Send someone to correct me. Send me to, to a place in your word to correct me. Speak to me in a dream. God, just don't let me get this wrong. Not my will. Lord, yours. We need to pray from a place of obedience and that brokenness. And then you know what happens? God inhabits broken vessels. Amen.